Good afternoon, everyone, and a very, very warm welcome to the inaugural Singapore Art Week Art Symposium. My name is Usha Chandradas from Plural Art Mag, and today I am your MC. So to our physical audience here at Victoria Theatre, we're so glad to have you with us, you know, joining us in person, and to our online audience watching the live stream of this event on Cystic Live from Singapore and from all over the world, thank you for dialing in. Now, over the last two days, our panelists have discussed a number of issues relevant to the art world today. On day one, they considered the significance of arts and cultural sites and the growth of the digital realm as a potential site for artistic engagement. On day two, our panelists delve deeper into the topic of art for the public, as well as citywide art events and whether they remain relevant in the age of COVID-19. Today, we close the symposium with three very exciting panels, two of which are presented by our partners ArtSG and Art and Market. Our speakers today will address the sustainability of art going digital, the growth of the art and luxury market in Asian economies, and finally, the learning points to be gleaned from our collective experiences in the past pandemic-ridden year. So without further ado, allow me to introduce the very first panel for today, who will be addressing the topic of art going digital and how sustainable these endeavours truly are. Now joining us on site at Victoria Theatre, our panellists, Mr Chong Hoi Singh and Ms Kim Tae, and the moderator I'm very pleased to introduce is my friend and business partner, Ms. Pauline Gunn from Plural Art Mag. Dialing in from the United Kingdom is Mr. Joe Elliott. Now, originally we were meant to have Ms. Natasha K. Whiffin dial in uh, to represent Art Logic, but unfortunately Natasha has been unexpectedly taken ill, and so Joe will be speaking in her place. Now, if you have any questions for our panelists here, we would invite you to please submit them at any time through the Pigeonhole Live website. Now, the Pigeonhole URL and event passcode will also be flashed during the panel session for your easy reference. Pigeonhole Live is a very simple interactive mobile website where you can submit questions to the panelists. If you have a smartphone, a laptop, a tablet with you, you know, you just launch your internet browser and enter www dot pigeonhole dot at in the address bar. Next, what you do is you key in our event passcode, which is ARTSYMP2021. So once again, that's ARTSYMP2021. You will then see all the panels in this event, and all you have to do is select the relevant panel and submit your question. So it's really very, very easy. And with all of that out of the way, let me hand you over to the panel moderator, Ms. Pauline Gunn. Pauline, over to you, please. Thank you, Usha. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for joining us here today for day three of the inaugural SOAR Art Symposium 2021. And to panel five, which asked the question, how sustainable is art going digital? Whereas on opening day, the panel on art and the digital realm looked at how innovations in digital technology have opened up new pathways for the creation and experience of art. In today's panel, we look at the impact and implications of digital technology on the ecosystem that sustains and supports artists' livelihoods, the art market. In the past year, the COVID-19 pandemic swept across the world, shuttering art galleries, closing down art fairs, and curtailing international travel. As galleries and fairs quickly pivoted to the digital space, offering online viewing rooms and virtual fairs, how successful were these efforts? And what are the implications for this shift for the future? With me today are three panelists who are eminently qualified to offer insights into this question. Their bios are available, or in the case of one of our speakers, will soon be available um, on the symposium page of the SOAR website. So I will keep my introductions brief to allow us more time to hear from the speakers themselves. In person with me here at Victoria Theatre, our prominent art collector and co-founder of Contemporary Art Salon, The Culture Story, Mr. Chong Hwai Seng, and Ms. Kim Tae, Senior Gallery Director of Art and Design Consultancy and Online Art Gallery, The Artling. 
We were also to have joining us from London, Ms. Natasha Whiffin, Head of Art Fairs and Strategic Partnerships for ArtLogic, one of the leading providers of technological uh, products and solutions for artists, galleries, collectors and art fairs. Unfortunately, um, we received news late last night that Ms. Whiffin is unwell and unable to join us today. We wish her a speedy recovery and are pleased to welcome her colleague, Senior Director and Chief Commercial Officer of ArtLogic, Mr. Joe Elliott, who has kindly agreed to step in in her place. Hi, Joe. Uh, thank you for joining us at what is a rather ungodly hour in your time zone. Um, to start us off, I'd like to invite each of our speakers to share a little bit about themselves and what they do. Mr. Chong, perhaps we could start with you. Uh, thank you, Huali. Um, good afternoon. I'm very pleased um, to be here uh, to participate uh, in this uh, session. Um, I would like to give a very brief introduction to the company, the culture story that I co-founded with my daughter, Ning Chong. Uh, unfortunately, she is not here today. Earlier this morning, she just gave birth to a, a second baby girl. Um, so we're all delighted to welcome another addition to the family. The culture story is also very much part of our family. It was founded in June 2017, and it is meant to be an alternative platform and space where we hope to gather art lovers, collectors, enthusiasts, so that we can all share, exchange um, ideas, um, uh, communicate, talk about what's going on uh, in the art world. Next slide, please. We have, uh, in the course of um, uh, the last three years, organized a lot of events in our space. Um, we organize basically a lot of uh, talks, a lot of uh, uh, gatherings for um, collectors to share their art journey. Uh, we've also organized residency programs. For example, uh, Fatura, the god of or the godfather of uh, street art, came to the Goucher story in um, October 2018 uh, to do a two-week residency at our place, producing about 30 pieces of uh, art, which we then staged uh, an exhibition for him at Gilman Barracks. Uh, we have also done exhibitions in partnership with other galleries, for example, in 2017, uh, we did a show for a very senior Singapore artist called Wong Keen. And uh, that was in collaboration with his uh, gallery in Singapore, Art Commune. So we hope through our various activities, uh, either showing artists uh, that we like in collaboration with other art galleries, or through our own events uh, where we will show our collection of art. For example, uh, this week and for the next uh, three to four months, uh, we have a collection, uh, a show, uh, based on my collection of newts, you know, which uh, I have acquired over the last 40 years. And the show is entitled Of Human Bondage. Um, very popular because it's not often that you see an exhibition of <laughs> nudes in Singapore. Um, yes, so we hope that through the culture story, uh, we can um, uh, connect a lot of art lovers in Singapore uh, through an alternative space like ours. We also hope that through our talks and and, and seminars, we could also 
uh, uh, introduce uh, art to the younger collectors because you know there are a lot of young collectors who who are interested in collecting but who are not uh, comfortable uh, taking the first step. So a lot of our uh, activities and events over the past uh, three years uh, have been directed at the younger, uh, newer collectors. Uh, as for myself, uh, I've been collecting for almost like 40 years. So it's always a journey. It's always discovering something new. And, uh, and today, in this uh, environment of the you know, pandemic, uh, the whole dynamics of the art industry has, uh, has changed uh, uh, quite drastically. And I hope uh, in this afternoon's uh, you know, discussion, uh, we can maybe uh, explore uh, what are some of the developments uh, that are going on, not just in Singapore, uh, but throughout the world. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chong. Um, I'd like to now invite Ms. Kim Tay from The Artling to tell us a little bit about herself and her work. Kim? Thank you, Pauline. And thank you to Plural and NAC for having me here. I'm very excited to be speaking alongside my fellow panelists on this topic. Um, just to give you a brief overview of what we do, The Artling is an online gallery and art consultancy based in Singapore with an office in Shanghai. We have been around since 2013, and since then we have seen quite a significant shift in terms of where the digital realm is growing. Um, I did have some slides. I don't know if it's working. Can we have Ms. Kim Tae's um, slides? Okay, great. So before we dive into the topic of the day, I wanted to give an overview of what we do. So more about the Artling. Our online platform lists over 300 galleries and 3,500 artists from all over the world. We originally launched with a focus on Southeast Asian contemporary art, but since then we've actually broadened our, um, our database to a far wider range of artists, as well as galleries. We also have an app, um, which I'll talk about a bit more later. We partner with over 25 art fairs every year. Um, we haven't really seen that change too much in the pandemic because even if art fairs physical iterations have been canceled, the online ones have continued and we've tried to support through exposure on our online magazine, The Art Scene. We have quite a unique online offline hybrid model where we have the online gallery that also feeds into our offline consultancy projects. So just to give you a brief overview of that, we offer end-to-end -end services where we work with clients from the point of sourcing and commissioning um, artworks all the way up to installation. So the images you see here are actually of the Straits Clan, which is a private members club in Singapore. When we first came on board the program, it was before the space had even been renovated. And what we did was we worked with the client to bring together a collection of local artists um, to tie more into the building's heritage and Straits Clan's kind of membership. And we're very excited to actually last night have launched our creative studio program for four local artists to have a space and residency period for the next four months. This is just to give an overview of some of the types of clients that we work with. So it's, it ranges all the way from hospitality projects to public commissions to corporate offices. And this is a sneak preview of a project we've been working on for the past two years. It's a series of two five-star resorts in the Maldives. Um, and we went on site a couple of years ago before anything was built. And since then, we obviously haven't been able to go back. So we've had to manage it remotely, which has been a challenge, but we're getting there. Um, for this, we worked with the architects and the interior designers very closely to commission artworks for both the public areas, so ranging from large-scale sculptures all the way to in-room artworks for each of the 200 villas. So you can kind of see the artworks in the background there. Uh, and this is one of our larger scale projects, which is here in Singapore. It's a six meter sculpture by Zheng Lu, who's a Chinese artist. And we worked with Fraser's Tower to commission the work for their office lobby in Fraser's Tower. And our Shanghai space. So as I'm sure everyone knows, China was hit the first with the pandemic and they shut down very quickly. 
Um, and when this happened, we launched our space in 2019. So we were really kind of just hitting a stride. And so there were, we were faced with a lot of uncertainty in the beginning of last year. But we saw within a few months how quickly China was bouncing back and really at an unprecedented level. So we were very excited to be able to support local Chinese artists by bringing three fantastic shows together, ranging from installation works um, to paintings and to photography. Uh, and this was something that I think we're very pleased to have been able to continue despite the difficulties of the situation and also none of our staff here being able to go to the Shanghai space for the past year. And then I wanted to talk a bit about our online initiatives. So we are an online gallery. So in terms of being able to support artists through the pandemic, I think our biggest priority was really to make sure they were able to keep making sales despite not being able to exhibit in a physical way. So one of the first initiatives that we launched was Art in My City, which is essentially pushing local buyers to buy from local artists because when the pandemic first hit, international logistics got incredibly difficult and cost prohibitive for a lot of buyers. So what we thought would, was good was to be able to support local artists and have that kind of feed into the local art scene in that way. We also spent a lot of time, um, we have three tech developers on our team and they were pushing a lot of artist profile features. So things that would feature the artist's studio, their process, their concepts behind their works, just being able to give a bit more information about their works and share more with potential buyers. Uh, we also improved our view in room feature, which allows for you to see the artworks to scale, any of the artworks on the website in different contexts and our AR feature. So this has been on our app for a while now, but it's something that we really try to utilize to push sales. One of the biggest challenges with showing artworks online is the visualization aspect. So a lot of buyers will see the work on the website and wonder how will it look on my wall. And this augmented reality feature really kind of transforms that. So this gives an example of what happened when a client saw the piece through our AR feature and actually ended up purchasing it. So on the left, we have the screenshot of the AR feature being used, and then on the right, the final artwork finally being installed. And I just wanna show a quick video of how simple it is to use the AR feature. Um, I'm not sure if anyone's tried it before, but it's very, very easy. Right, and just to wrap it up, I think for us, the potential of technology to transform the way that you're viewing art and purchasing art online is endless. And we're always trying to look at new technologies and new efforts that can be made. So for us, the next steps, including use of the AR feature is to allow for salon hang kind of um, placement through AR or through scale features, as well as placement of 3D objects. So like sculptures or design pieces. Yes, that's all I got. Thank you so much, Kim. That's really interesting. And I think this really segues very well into our third speaker, joining us from London, uh, Mr. Joe Elliott. Can we get him online? Joe, um, can I just... Hi, thank you for joining us all the Hello. way from London. Um, can I just invite you now to just share a little bit about yourself and about ArtLogic's work? Sure. Yeah, I'd be, um, I'd be happy to. I, I apologise that I'm uh, not Natasha, uh, <laughs> but hopefully I'll be able to provide some, some interesting insights today and uh, um, what we do and, and, and what's been going on in the, in the last year. So, um, as was mentioned before, my name is Joe Elliott. I'm the Chief Commercial Officer um, at ArtLogic. I oversee um, everything client-facing at ArtLogic, so that encompasses um, sales, marketing, customer success, um, but I also work um, heavily within kind of our, um, product development, our product roadmap, and also just our strategy as a whole. Um, throughout my career, I've always been a passionate advocate of how we can use technology to 
enhance the way that we sell, manage, and experience art both online and in person. Um, I myself, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm trained as an artist originally, so I'm kind of deeply creative at my core, and I, I care hugely about um, design and the way that um, intuitive and beautiful design can and should be used um, to promote um, and to display art you know, and artistic objects online. So, you know, design is very deeply at the core of myself and also Art Logic and our mission uh, at Art Logic as well. So a little bit more information, I, I, I shall, I'll, I'll try to keep it brief, but just a little bit more information on us at Art Logic and what we do for those that don't know. Um, unfortunately, I apologize, I don't uh, have any slides to show, but I'd uh, welcome you all to uh, go and check out our website and I'll highlight a few projects today. Um, that you can go take a look at as well to get a sense of the sort of work that we do. But fundamentally, we are a SaaS firm. So uh, we're um, software as a provider. Um, what that means is we provide um, cloud-based solutions um, that are tailored specifically to the art market. So we're quite niche in that regard. Um, there are two main products that we provide, um, working predominantly with galleries, artists, and collectors, um, and recently, which I'll talk more about a little later on this year, we started working a lot more with art fairs as well. Uh, but the two core products that we offer is the, the ArtLogic database, which is really a gallery management software or artist studio management or collection management software, dependent on which sector your, you, you know, what, what your background is. And we also offer and uh, we build websites as well. And they often come as an integrated, a fully integrated package. So in addition to the database and the website being the core of what we do, we also have a whole bunch of additional products that integrate with those services. So for example, in the database, we have a mass mailing system similar to MailChimp. Uh, we have an iPhone and iPad app called Private Views, which our clients tend to use at art fairs to um, help present and share artworks. Um, and of course, uh, we build um, online beer rooms, which has been very much the um, topic of the last year and an acronym I'm sure you're all tired to death of, um, but um, no doubt we'll talk more about today. Um, so our goal really as a company is to, it's very common that when we go and speak to a client, if it's a gallery, for example, that they'll have a kind of tech setup that is, first of all, offline, so that they have you know, solutions, a gallery management software that's not cloud-based. And what you tend to find is galleries have, you know, or artist studios have multiple different systems and none of them are integrated with one another. So they might have a database um, built by one company. They'll have their website built and managed by another company. Um, they might then have a separate iPhone, iPad sales app managed by yet another company. Uh, they might use a mass mailing tool like, um, uh, MailChimp, and then they might even use an accounting service like Xero or QuickBooks. Our goal as a company is to help um, organizations bring everything together. So integrate all of those products into one centralized system so that you're not doing double data entry into multiple systems over and over and over again. Um, so that's a little bit about us. I hope that um, makes sense. Like I said, I'll talk more about our kind of you know, movement into working with more art fairs uh, um, a little later on uh, in, in the in the discussion. Um, we, as a company, we are a team of 50. We have 50 employees. Um, we have two primary offices. Our headquarters are in, in London. Um, we have a team of uh, five, soon to be six, in the US. Um, and we recently hired our first um, uh, freelance consultant in Berlin as well. Um, we have 2,000 clients globally now um, uh, from countries all over the world um, in every, uh, uh, um, almost every different country you, you, you might imagine. So um, things have certainly been growing rapidly this year um, it, um, as people have been looking to have required really um, better, better digital solutions as a result of the pandemic. But again, we'll dive into that in more detail later on in the talk, I'm sure. So I shall um, leave it there, I hope that helps. Um, and yeah, like I said, for a little more information on what we do, go, do go check out our website. And I'll, I'll, I'll highlight a few projects throughout the talk today um, that you can go take a look at. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. And thank you, Mr. Chong and Kim. So let's 
dive right into the questions. I already have 12 questions on pigeonhole um, with votes on the questions, but I'm just going to start with some questions that I prepared for our panelists, beginning with Kim and Joe. Both the Artlink and Artlogic had already been operating in the digital space, which, as it turns out in the light of events of the past year, put you somewhat ahead of the curve, so to speak. What impact, if any, did the pandemic have on your businesses? And what changes did you experience? Kim, perhaps we'll start with you. Sure. Uh, yeah, I mean, we've been online since we launched, so a bit ahead of the curve in that way. But what we actually saw in terms of positives over the year was we had a 60% increase in listings from artists across the year, which was unprecedented for us, as well as almost doubling of our online sales that were made on the platform. What we had to cope with, I would say, was more the logistics issue, which I mentioned earlier in that, again, logistics were very difficult in the early days of the pandemic, and there were fewer flights, so cost of shipping got more expensive. So that was something that we had to tackle as well as some of the pieces used to come actually to our office for us to do quality check before they got sent off to the client. So what we had to do was implement a new system to check the condition of each work. So now we have a mostly foolproof system in place that allows us to check every angle, every aspect of the artwork before it's shipped out directly from the artist or gallery to the buyer. Thank you. And um, Joe? Uh, I know you have a, ArtLogic has like a range of products that you've already mentioned, but I would imagine, and I think you said so just now, that perhaps the surge was in the online viewing rooms. Perhaps you could share a little bit more about how the pandemic has changed how ArtLogic's business um, or your business this year. Sure, yeah, I, I would be happy to. Um, well, it's changed everything. <laughs> um, I, I think we, you know, we came into the year um, as we always do with our goals and strategies for, for, for what we wanted to achieve in the year. And by the time we got to the end of March, we basically ripped everything up and just um, headed in a completely different direction. Um, we were already um, seeing a lot of growth in our website products before this year. So we've been working hard on our, on our websites and, and trying to get more sort of off the shelf solutions for clients. But when the pandemic hit, it really changed everything in an instant. So the, uh, a few things happened. The first um, flood of inquiries that we saw coming in, and it was a dramatic increase. I think we saw inquiries shoot up about 75%. Um, was for online viewing rooms, of course. Um, at the, you know, as galleries were closing their spaces, they desperately needed better digital solutions. Um, and luckily for us, about two years prior, we'd built our first online viewing room for a client of ours, um, Alan Cristea, now Cristea Roberts, which is a gallery based on Pall Mall in London. And we were actually building a custom, uh, a bespoke website for them. So we have two website products, our kind of premium custom built bespoke websites. And then we have our kind of um, out of the box, you know, off the shelf template websites, more similar to like Squarespace. So we built this custom built website for them and they had been looking at other online viewing rooms and said, we'd like to build this in. We were like, great. So we built that into the, to their website. And at the time we were building it in, we decided that it would be sensible for us to build this back into the core as a kind of uh, feature that clients could turn on our template websites. And as it turned out, that was perhaps one of the uh, better business decisions I think we've made um, at, because as the pandemic hit that's what everyone desperately needed and luckily for us you know we had it pretty much ready out of the box um, so we refocused our entire team of course we had to make changes really really fast to the online view rooms because we realized quickly that people didn't want to build an entirely new website. They didn't have time to do that. What they really wanted was a quick, you know, they just wanted to be able to create the online beer room tool specifically. So we had to work fast. We changed the model for our online beer rooms. We made a, an online beer room only product and we repriced that um, so that basically galleries could make a microsite, you know, similar to you might, you have e sometimes organizations as opposed to you know, they might build their e-commerce shop, for example, with a tool like Shopify, but they have their main website still built by another company. And so it's a microsite. So we fundamentally did the same thing for online view rooms. Um, and it, we've never experienced anything like it, the amount of uh, inquiries coming in. To give you an idea, before the pandemic <clears throat> in March, one in 40 of our clients was using our online view room feature. 
now one in three of our clients are using our online viewing feature. Um, over the course of the last year, it wasn't just, of course, online viewing rooms, it's just website you know, activity in general rocketed. And we saw um, our sales in websites increase 120% throughout the year, which was just completely unprecedented. Um, we're a company that's been in business now for 26 years. Uh, I think a lot of people think of us as a startup just because we're cloud-based, but we've been in, yeah, in business 26 years. And then if you think about it in one year, we doubled the number of websites we had, which is nuts. So it was quite full on, I won't lie. <laughs> I think our team uh, were incredible and really kind of fought the good fight to try and get services out to people. So that was the first flood of inquiries that came in. And the second flood of inquiries that came in was from uh, art fairs. So we hadn't really worked with art fairs that much before. We did have a few art fair clients who used our database, but not really. Um, and uh, it wasn't just art fairs, also member organizations. So we had the ADAA reach out to us early on in the pandemic to say, um, is there any way that we could, that you guys could help us to provide an online viewing room solution to all of our galleries who don't have it currently? So we thought to ourselves, well, is there a way that maybe we could um, deliver lots of micro, sort of small art logic databases to all of those ADA exhibitors who aren't already clients of ours? Um, and that all of these mini databases could feed into one centralized website because normally a gallery buys their database and then they have their own website and those to integrate. But now what we were looking at doing was saying, well, maybe let's deliver, you know, 70, 100 small art logic databases and allow them to all feed um, data into one centralized ADAA online viewing rooms platform. And that was the birth really of a completely new product for us, which has become our events uh, platform. And, um, and as a result of that, we hired Natasha, who was meant to be speaking in my place. So we hired Natasha. Um, she came across from Art Basel, had worked for Paddle 8 before that as well. Um, so a lot of experience in the space. She came in specifically to help us manage this flood of inquiries that we were starting to get from fairs because early on in the pandemic, I think a lot of fairs, like all of us thought, oh, we'll probably be okay. You know, um, it, it will be able to, to still put the fair on by the time it comes around to our fair. And increasingly that just wasn't the case. So we got more and more inquiries. Um, so since that very first platform of the ADA, we've done projects with NADA. We did two projects with them, which was fantastic. Um, we have done projects with the Outsider Art Fair. In fact, our second online viewing room with the Outsider Art Fair just went live yesterday. So the team have been working really, really hard on that. So do go um, take a look. It's the um, Outside Art Fair um, New York and their online viewing room just launched. And uh, equally, we're really excited to be launching um, a big online viewing room initiative with FIAC. So we're helping FIAC to um, produce their first online viewing room. They're doing a digital only version in uh, March, March 4th to 7th. Uh, I believe the date's the first week of March. So keep an eye out for that. Um, the whole thing page is already live, so you can go and sign up you know, if you're uh, interested to get notifications. So, so that has really been, you know, as a result of the pandemic, we've actually ended up building basically two new products, um, which is which has really been a change and, you know, obviously completely different plans to what we were thinking initially, but um, it's been, um, it's been a journey. It's been really great to, to be able to try and help as many galleries as we possibly could to really survive in a really, really difficult time and to try and help them move their operations online. Um, so, yeah, that's, uh, I hope that gives a little bit more of an indication. No, that's, of that's really side. very interesting. Thank you, Joe. Now, I'd like to ask Mr. Chong from the point of view of a collector who's been collecting art, uh, traveling globally to see art, attend art fairs. How did the closure of physical galleries and art fairs and the inability to travel affect your collecting patterns and habits? I mean, we've heard from the representatives of galleries and uh, providers, but I'd like to hear how you felt. Well, to be honest, it's been awful, you know, painful almost. <laughs> uh, not being able to travel and not being able to, uh, to see art, physical art, you know, uh, in front of you. And, uh, and I'm kind of like old school when it comes to uh, looking at art, uh, and especially when it comes to uh, buying art. Uh, we normally will only buy art which we can see in front of us, or maybe even touch, you know. 
but to not be able to to travel and not be able to visit uh, you know a gallery or talk to an artist uh, has been extremely difficult but I think we have adjusted and uh, over the last uh, 12 months, uh, particularly because of the pandemic and the restrictions and the fact that there is now so many art fairs and auctions and you know, gallery openings uh, that are done online, right, with some really uh, very cool uh, tools, you know, uh, digital tools. So I think we are now very much uh, uh, transformed in terms of our uh, viewing and you know buying habits, you know. And I think, uh, for example, last year uh, we bought quite a big artwork at uh, in the, in Taipei during Art uh, Tang Tai, you know, which is something which. You know, if you ask me, would I spend that money like three, five years ago without seeing the art? <laughs> I think it was like, no way, you know? But, uh, but now I think it's the new way. So uh, whether we like it or not as, as collectors, and of course the young collectors, you know, the millennials and whatnot, I think they don't have any problem uh, buying art and shopping for art uh, online. But it's guys like us, you know, who are in our 60s and 70s, uh, who are not used to, to, you know, to going online, uh, now, because of what's happened, uh, we have to adjust. So I think, in a way, I think, uh, you know, we have all changed, even the old school types like me. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm really very um, struck to know that you bought an artwork for the was it for the first time without seeing it? Uh, uh, yes, and it was one of our more expensive uh, yeah. buys as well. You know, well done, well <laughs> so, done for embracing the So it the was digital. it was quite a, 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 a revelation for for Ning and myself. There are you know so many questions coming in, and I see that we have only seven minutes left and uh, before we go on to the next panel. So um, let me just ask our panelists, I, I'm going to skip through to other questions uh, without running through the ones that I had planned. It seems to me personally that this forced pivot to the digital realm has opened my eyes and I think Mr. Chong for example, to the potential that digital technology has to create engaging, immersive experiences of art, like the AR tool that you mentioned, Kim, beyond the conventional grid layout on a static website. Having had to embrace the digital in a way that we might have been close to previously, and knowing what we know now, is there any going back? What will the shape of the art landscape be post-COVID? Kim, would you like to respond? Well, I don't see it going back to what it was before, uh, or at least I hope not. I think that this jump into the digital realm is, is great for exposure for a lot of artists, as well as great for the art market in general, because I think we're a huge proponent of transparency, and that's been very difficult for the art market to get used to um, in the past or in the past few years. So we hope, I think, that people rethink the way that they see art. I don't think it's... It's not possible to replicate the in-person viewing experience. We know this. I know this having seen art for the first time in person at all the Singapore Art Week events. It's very, very difficult, but I think what we can do is try to use technology to replicate it as best we can, even if it can't be entirely reproduced. Yeah. Thank you. And Joe, would you like to weigh in on my question? Sure, yeah, I know I'd be happy to. Um, well. I don't think there's any going back at all. <laughs> I think it's here to stay now, um, but not in a bad way, but I think because people are now aware of the power of what can be done online. Uh, as long as you have the right tools available to you, you can create really wonderful um, things. But I think it's really important to point out, you know, from our perspective that um, this is absolutely not about replacing the experience of um, seeing um, art in person. Um, we're all, you know, so many of us are art logic are artists or art professionals or creatives, and we're all as desperate as everyone else is to get back out and see art in person. 
But I think what people now understand is the power of what digital, great digital tools can provide as a complement to the physical experience. Um, to give an example, uh, around uh, March last year, um, right before everything sort of got shut down, I was luckily in New York for the Armory Show, um, the last art fair that any of us experienced, I think. And myself and my um, uh, director of sales in the US, Serena, were going over to um, see a client of ours. We went over to, we, were, we had a meeting at Marion Goodman Gallery and we were, we were in the gallery and we had about five minutes before our meeting and there was a beautiful Gerhard Richter show on. So I thought to myself, I picked up the press release and looked at it, two pages, quite dense. I'm dyslexic. I thought to myself, it's probably gonna take me a while to read this. I should just go around and look at the show. So I ran around these beautiful, impactful GitHub Richter paintings, you know, uh, without knowing anything about the show, you can stand in front of those and experience them. But at the same time, I didn't really get a chance to understand the kind of narrative and the story behind that show. Having then left the gallery, um, the Mary and Goodman had really sort of just begun to dive into the online viewing rooms. I was then able after the fact to go online, look at the exhibition, um, experience a, an online viewing room that had a video, a walkthrough, um, it had pull quotes from the artist, it had shots from the studio. Um, it was able to give me an insight that I never could have really got unless I'd perhaps gone to the opening or to an artist talk, for example. Um, so I think the digital affords A, the opportunity for us to circle back to something after the fact, and it also broadens the audience as well. Um, it acts as a wonderful complement to the physical and also allows people who can't physically go to the show to experience it online in a much more immersive, um, impactful way. Thank you. Um, I have a question here for Mr. Chong. Many congratulations on your recent show on New Dart, Mr. Chong. Do you think it would have worked as well in a digital format? Um, I think it might, but uh, uh, but I'm old school, you know. So I I I, I believe that uh, uh, coming to the uh, to the gallery and uh, viewing the show, uh, and because we also got sculptures which you can touch and, and so on. So I think that 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 tactile and and that physical uh, uh, connection uh, with the artwork is uh, you know is important. Um, but I like to sort of go back to your earlier question about whether there is, you know, any going back. Uh, yes, please. Uh, I, I, I feel that as a collector, uh, before maybe the pandemic, uh, before the, the, the advance of, you know, digital art and exhibitions and what have you, um, uh, a collector like me, if you go by the 80-20 rule, will probably spend 20% of my buying budget uh, in buying art through uh, digital space, you know, whether it's Instagram right. or uh, email and, you know, JPEGs and, you know, what have you. And the, the other 80% is, you know, going really to art A fairs and, show. you know, gallery openings and, and so on. But I think with, with this pandemic and if it continues for another year, two years or, you know, God forbid, three years, I think the 80-20 rule will probably, I mean, the eight. The 2080 rule will probably be inverted, where I will be spending 80% of my budget um, buying things online and only 20% uh, maybe in Singapore because that's the only you know place where I can physically go and visit uh, you know galleries, and uh, uh, it might happen to other collectors as well. Yeah. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, there's so much more to unpack and so much rich information that I'd like to tease out from our speakers. But I'm afraid we've run out of uh, time and we're, we need to move on to the next panel. I think the best uh, the takeaway I have from this is that what we've learned, to, what we've discovered is not that um, online spaces are meant to replace physically viewing art, but that actually they can work together eventually when we can physically go and see shows and offer, as Joe mentioned, uh, information, um, more information about the artists and things like that, that will actually enhance our physical experience of viewing the art. So let's look forward to the, the day when we can have our cake and eat it and have both. Thank you very much, Joe, for joining us from London. Thank you, Kim. 
Thank you, Mr. Chong, and thank you, ladies and gentlemen, um, for joining us for this talk. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Hoi Sing, Kim, Joe, Pauline, you know, for that really, really frank session. I think we got some great nuggets out of that. Now, I'd just like to briefly introduce the next fully online panel, which will commence very shortly at 3 p.m. So it will be presented by our partners, ArtSG, and the panel is entitled ArtSG and the UBS Discussion Series, Tigers and Art, the Economic, Social, Demographics and Consumer Context for the Art and Luxury Market in Southeast Asia. So that will be coming up very shortly. It will be fully online. Um, and for those of us here in Victoria Theatre and watching the live stream as well, we will now take a very short break for the changeover in panels. We hope you continue to stay with us. Thank you very much. <laughs>